Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the second lecture of this particular course which is entitled Gender and Literature. So we talked about in the first lecture we talked about some of the uh, fundamental features of this connection between gender and literature. We talked about what is gender, we talked about the uh, gender as a performance, how it plays out not just in intellectual literary uh, spaces but also in real spaces, social spaces, cultural spaces, uh, political spaces. Uh, and how gender is performed through rhetoric, through the body, through language, uh, you know, through dress, through food, through different kinds of cultural signifiers. So what we'll do today, we'll, we'll begin to become a little more specific. So the first lecture was an introduction to you. It introduced a topic to you. It discussed some of the salient features, some of the fundamental features, some of the uh, main integral components of this particular course. So, today will be the second lecture, the second introductory lecture, uh, after which we will move on to some specific texts. So, what I will do today essentially is I will talk about two uh, theories, two terms, two critical terms, which are in my mind extremely essential uh, for any study of gender and performance and especially how those play out in literature, society, culture, politics, etcetera. So, I have entitled this particular lecture as performativity and embodiment, a critical discussion. So, I will talk a little bit about what performativity is, what embodiment is and how are these relevant in uh, any study of gender, in any discussion on gender, uh, especially in its relation to literature, especially in its relation to society through you know body, politics, language etcetera. And then I will branch out you know I will become a bit wide and talk about how these connect to uh, other things, other aspects of uh, what we see around us, what we feel, see, think, intellectualize around us. So, first things first, what is performativity? Now, performativity and this is the working definition I use for the purpose of this course and we will find how it sort of connects to different other aspects, it connects to different literary texts, it connects to different social activities, different cultural activities, different political activities etcetera. So, performativity is performance that is designed to generate an effect and its corresponding iconic identity, sometimes through a spectacle, it is often deliberately dramatic and excessive, aiming to move its consumer with a sense of awe, adulation and reverence, often a mixture of all three. So, in other words, performativity is effective performance. It is the performance which is designed, deliberately designed to generate an effect, to produce an effect. Now, the effect could be as I mentioned awe, adulation, reverence, fear, worship, respect, love, everything. It, it could be a combination, it could be a complex effect, it could be a combination of all these different kinds of effects. But the point I am trying to make is performativity is a deliberately designed performance. And because it is deliberately designed, it is sometimes uh, excessive, it is often excessive actually, it is often dramatic, uh, it sometimes combines drama with excess, it is spectacular, uh, it is often larger than life and it sometimes is used, performativity is used as a strategy sometimes to produce an iconic identity. Now the question is, the obvious question you might have at this point is how is this related to gender? In what way is performativity is an important term in gender studies? Now, if you just look at the definition that it is some, something which produces an effect, it is a spectacle, it is dramatic, it is excessive, uh, it produces identity, um, often a deliberately excessive identity, an iconic identity uh, and more importantly it produces emotions such as uh, awe, reverence, fear, respect, love, sometimes a combination of all these 
you know different aspects. Now, if you just take this into consideration, you find performativity is an extremely important component in gender and gendered identity. It's what we perform, right? It's how we perform a certain kind of gender, a certain kind of dominant gender identity. So, for instance, if you want to perform, uh, if you're thinking about performativity as an aspect of producing a certain kind of masculinity, a certain brand of masculinity. Uh, a certain religious brand of masculinity, a certain political brand of masculinity, a certain racial brand of masculinity, a certain linguistic brand of masculinity. Now, in that sense, if you aim to produce a certain brand of masculinity, a certain order of masculinity, performativity becomes a very key feature. It's how you do it, right? How you do it through language, how you do it through clothes, how you do it through dress, how you do it through you know culture, how you do it through your body, how you do it through your effect, to your spectacle, to all these combined together. So, performativity is an affective performance which is designed to generate a certain kind of gender identity. It could be a hegemonic gender identity, it could be a subversive gender identity, it could be a combination of hegemonic and subversive. right? But in the case of gender studies what we are doing in this particular course, performativity is a very key component and I will come back to it especially in this relation to theta because one of the key things we will do as part of the relationship between gender and literature is to look at theatre uh, as the performative space as something which produces performed identities, gendered identities which are quite complex uh, in the different combinations and uh, you know negations. Now, the second term that I want to spend some time with today is embodiment. What is embodiment? Now, embodiment and again this is a working definition I am taking uh, for the purpose of the schools and you can you know broaden it, you can you know complicate it, problematize it even further uh, if you reflect on it, but this is the starting working definition which we will use for the purpose of this particular course. So, embodiment may be defined as a corporeal, psychological, material and abstract apparatus with which a self navigates across and interacts with the immediate environment. So, I will come back to I'll come to the second definition later, but this particular definition the first definition we are looking at is a combination of corporeal which is the bodily, psychological, material and abstract apparatus. The embodiment is a material phenomenon as well as an abstract phenomenon. It is something which really happens to the body, to the mind, to the nerves, to you know the neural mechanism, the motor mechanism which we use as human beings as thinking, feeling human beings and also it is an extended cultural phenomenon as well. So, it is embodied, embedded as well as extended. It is a very complex thing embodiment, it is something we should do all the time without realizing it. right? So, it is a combination of corporeal, psychological, material and abstract apparatus. Now, what does this apparatus do? What does this apparatus help to do? It helps us to navigate, it gives you a sense of self, it gives you a sense of your body, your ownership on the self with which you navigate across and interact with the immediate environment. And the word environment here is crucial as well. I use the word environment as a very complex category. It is it's cultural environment, it is physical environment, it is a linguistic environment, it is ideological environment, it is intellectual environment, it is a series of different kinds of environments. right? And the key is how does the self navigate with its different orders of embodiment and the process through which the self navigates is what we define, what I define in this particular course as embodiment. So, embodiment is a process like performativity, it is a process a process of becoming something. Equally, it is a process of unbecoming something, right? because you want to become something, you want to generate a certain kind of identity and equally that identity might subvert certain other kinds of identities. So, it is a process of becoming as well as unbecoming, it is a process of construction as well as deconstruction and we will talk about deconstruction later in this course. It is a very crucial term especially if you are looking at gender uh, as an act of construction, deconstruction and reconstruction. So, performativity and embodiment both are processes of constructing a certain sense of self and for the purpose of this course we are more interested in the sense of the gendered self. right? So, what is a hegemonic gendered self? What is a dominant gendered self? What is a subversive gendered self? What is a marginalized gendered self? So, all these different kinds of gendered selves are created through performances, uh, through acceptance of certain performances uh, and through different kinds of embodiment, through different orders of embodiment. All right. So, embodiment then you know having defined embodiment what does embodiment um, depend on? What does it draw on right uh, to, for its sustenance right? 
So embodiment depends on a series of material conditions, such as language, culture, and race. The relationship between race and gender is very crucial. And we'll talk about that in great details when we move on to a certain text, which we'll cover in this particular course. So it's almost, you know, you know, it's, it's sort of enmeshed with each other, race and gender, racial identity, gendered identity, uh, they sort of often problematize one another, right? So embodiment depends on a series of material conditions such as language, culture and race. Now culture is a very loaded term. Uh, we talk about culture sometimes without really realizing what it entails. So the, the point is, is culture a material thing? Is culture a conceptual thing? Is culture an abstract thing? Is culture an, you know, a real thing? Is culture an imaginative thing? Or is it a combination of all these categories? Right? So culture obviously is a very loaded term. It is dependent on certain material things like economy, language, uh, you know, dress code, the body, uh, certain assumptions, etc. And equally, it's an abstract thing because it's not something you can put a finger to, right? You can talk about it, you can intellectualize it, you can have seminars on culture, etc. But if someone asks you uh, to locate culture, you know, it's very hard to pin it down to one thing, to one object. So it's an object as well as a, a concept. It's a combination of a conceptual category as well as an objective category, culture. So it's, it's, it depends embodiment on a series of material conditions such as language, culture and race. It's complexly connected to the notion of identity. Right? When we look at gender studies, when we do gender studies, uh, the notion of identity becomes really crucial because identity is something which is produced through gender. Your gendered identity is a very crucial category. Right? So, uh, whether it's a hegemonic identity in a certain culture, whether it's a marginalized identity in a certain culture, whether it's the hegemonic identity becoming marginalized in a certain culture, whether it's a marginalized identity becoming hegemonic in a certain culture, it's a process of becoming and unbecoming. And that's something I want to really uh, stress in this lecture today, really emphasize that gender is a process of becoming as well as unbecoming. And that process happens through embodiment. The process happens through performativity. So performativity and embodiment are the ways in which gender is done, as are the ways in which gender happens or unhappens, if you, you know, want to use a more complex term. So it is complexly connected to the notion of identity and its associated performativity. Right? So gender, identity, performativity, embodiment, all these are crucially connected, complexly connected. So embodiment is connected to performativity. Right? So what you are embodying, how do you embody yourself? through language, through culture, uh, through dress, through food, through your body, of course. And all these come together and produce identity or identities because it all, it all depends on space and time. Identity, as you all know, is notoriously culture and context sensitive. So you can't have possibly, you can't possibly have something called an absolute identity. I mean, that doesn't exist. Every identity, every idea of an identity is crucially connected to a certain context. And it's absolutely imperative for us doing gender studies to dissect or deconstruct or dig up the context because every gendered identity is born or generated out of a certain cultural context, right? So you can't do, if you're looking at gender as a text, something that happens materially, conceptually, intellectually, uh, really, unreally, you know, you know, a combination of all these things. If you're looking at gender as a text, you cannot possibly do a proper study of gender without looking at a cultural context. So every text is produced out of a context. Okay? And we know that you know, those of us who do critical theory are completely aware and sensitive to the, you know, the importance of the context, the cultural context. So embodiment uh, as something which depends on performativity, something which depends on, on generates identity, it inhabits the interface between the real and the virtual. So embodiment is something which happens really at a real level. Uh, you know, you, you are what you are, you embody yourself as a real person, but equally you embody yourself as a concept, as a gendered concept, as a cultural context, as, as, as an uh, ideological concept, right? It inhabits the interface between the real and the virtual, the biological and the ideological, and is often a marker for gender, right? Because remember gender is something which is as biological as it is ideological or rather I should say as ideological as it is biological. It's something which is produced ideologically. The notion of gender, gender is often a notion, an idea, right? Which depends obviously on the body of the person, the sexuality of the person, etc. But equally, it depends on the acceptance of the body, the acceptance of the sexuality of the person and in a certain cultural context. So in that sense, it's quite ideological, it's quite discursive, right? So 
Embodiment, then, is a real biological, corporeal, neural, motor process. Equally, it's a conceptual, abstract, illogical, discursive process. And throughout this course, uh, when we look at gender and literature, when we do gender studies, a serious study of gender, is absolutely imperative that we look at the interface between ideology and biology, between discourse and the motor mechanism of what we are, the neural mechanism of what we are, the real embodied neural motor self and the extended ideological discursive self. How are these two selves connected? Right? So, an examination of this connection, an examination of this interface between biology and ideology is absolutely imperative when we look at gender studies. Okay. Right. So, what is the relationship between embodiment and identity? Okay. And you know, if, if you just think about what we talked about now, what I discussed now, it is a very easy connection to make between embodiment and identity. It is a complex connection, but it is easy to understand the complexity of it. So, the relationship between embodiment and identity, especially in relation to gender studies, because that is what we are doing in this particular course, is complex and crucial. It is really complex and it is very crucial, I and mean, it is something which we cannot avoid. If we really do a serious study of gender, it is absolutely imperative that we look at the relationship between embodiment of gender and the identity of gender. How does embodiment produce identity? Okay? For embodiment, it is both a neural bodily mechanism uh, and the social cultural mechanism through which the self navigates, generates and regenerates its identity. So, this is something I keep stressing throughout this course, I will keep stressing throughout this course. It is a neural bodily mechanism, it is what we are through the body, through our nerves, through our motor mechanism, through our mind, through our consciousness, all this which are sort of embodied you know, embedded in us. Right? But equally, it is also an extended mechanism, it is cultural. Right? It is a social cultural mechanism, it is dependent on a particular culture, it is dependent on when you, when you, at your location in a particular culture, how are you located in a particular culture. Right? So, this play between the ideological and the biological, between the discursive and the motor, uh, between the real and the quote unquote unreal is very complex, it is something which we really uh, need to investigate and examine when we look at gender studies. Right? Because embodiment then is thus a private as well as a public internal as well as an external, biological as well as the performative in relation to gender. Right? So, when we look at the relationship between embodiment and gender, we need to look at all these interfaces, right? all these interfaces which come together and produce different categories of gender identities. Right. So, so having given you a brief idea, hopefully you know it is a robust idea of what is embodiment and what is performativity and how are these two connected especially in relation to identity as you look at in gender. Let us move on and connect to certain some, some of the things which we discussed in the previous lecture. The other thing which we discussed in the previous lecture if you remember is the concept of agency. Right? What is agency and how is agency related to gender. Right? We talked about that in, in some details in the previous lecture and what I will do today now is I am going to connect. Uh, the notion of agency, the idea of agency, the apparatus of agency with these two topics which we just covered embodiment and performativity. So, agency as we know uh, as we discussed in the previous lecture is the ability of the self to, to articulate its free will and in connection to that to bring about a change, the ability of the self to bring about a change through an articulation of its free will. Right? So, obviously, as you can see, I mean having looked at embodiment, having looked at performativity, there is a degree of performativity in agency. Can you perform your agency? Can you embody your agency? Right? Is it possible for you to embody your agency in a way which is complex in relation to gender, gender studies, especially the way in which gender plays out in society, in real spaces, in cultural spaces, etcetera. Now, for the rest of this lecture, I mean a good part of the rest of the lecture. I will talk about um, how the relationship between agency, performativity and embodiment uh, play out or plays out rather uh, in theatre. And I will choose certain plays which are familiar to most of you. Uh, the most fertile field to look at, the best, the most immediately interesting field to look at if you are interested in any idea of gender, in any idea of performativity, in any idea of embodiment, especially the way these connect with each other is to look at the theatre of Shakespeare. Well, Renaissance theatre for the matter. Now, if you read uh, almost any play of Shakespeare, uh, especially the comedies of Shakespeare, you will find a large part of that depends on what we just de define as performativity. 
right? Uh, that dramatic, excessive spectacle through which you perform a certain kind of identity, through which you generate a certain kind of identity, right? Through which you construct a certain kind of identity. And equally, uh, the process of construction often entails, often incorporates the process of deconstruction simultaneously, right? So, how is gender uh, performed? How is gender embodied, right? How is gender constructed, deconstructed, and reconstructed in some of Shakespeare's plays? That is something which we are deeply interested in, especially if you are looking at the relationship between gender and literature, you know, because you know we talk about Shakespeare as being uh, canonical literature, you know, this theatre, this canonical theatre is something which you keep going back to. Uh, and we have adaptations of Shakespeare done over and over again in India and different parts of the world. Right. So, let us look at some of the very familiar plays of Shakespeare. Uh, and the first play which we will look at today, you know, I will discuss it in some details informally and then we can you know move on to a more serious discussion on it and then we can you know reflect on it and perhaps uh, we can talk about it in terms of assignment is a play called Twelfth Night. Right. Now, Twelfth Night is a comedy. Uh, written by William Shakespeare, it's one of his finest comedies. Uh, it's also a, a very problematic play when it comes to gender studies. Okay, and those of you who have read Two of Night would know uh, immediately what I'm talking about and how. And what I want to do at this part of this lecture is to look at the way uh, in which these theoretical concepts like embodiment, agency, performativity, identity, how these play out in a literary text, especially in a theatre text, because theatre. Uh, is performative. Theatre is something which is immediately performative. You have people playing different kinds of roles. Uh, it is a performative space. The moment you watch a play in a theatre, the moment you walk into a theatre space in order to watch a play, you are aware of its performative uh, quality, you are aware of its performative quotient. Okay? And you know, often times uh, you know, difference between a good play and a bad play uh, depends on the way performativity happens or does not happen in a particular drama. Right. So, in Twelfth Night, uh, it is a really magnificent play and it is a very important play especially if you are looking at you know gender studies uh, from a performative angle. So, what happens to Twelfth Night? Those of you who know the play will know it, will are aware of it, but again for the purpose of discussion I will narrate and summarize the play and then I will move on to how uh, performativity, embodiment and identity all these come together in a very complex way in this particular play by Shakespeare, Twelfth Night. So, Twelfth Night starts with a shipwreck. right? Now, the moment there are lots of shipwrecks in Shakespeare and you know the funny thing is almost nobody dies, nobody dies in a shipwreck in Shakespeare. Uh, these are happy shipwrecks where reunions are made, where lost family is you know reconnected to, uh, people find their old siblings, people forgive their enemies. So, the shipwreck in Shakespeare is not necessarily a bad thing, it is often a happy thing, it is something which triggers a happy union, a familial happy union. So, that is a really interesting thing in Shakespeare. Now, in Twelfth Night, we have uh, two light twins, right? We have a brother and a sister who look exactly like each other. You know, they're completely identical, except for the fact that they are different sexually, biologically. So uh, we have, you know, a brother and sister who are shipwrecked, right? And then you know the sister comes uh, to you know the, an island called Illyria, and the brother's lost for a period of time, and then the sister dresses up as a man. Uh, and then different complications happen in the play uh, as the play progresses. So, uh, we have uh, a countess in two of night, we have a count in two of night and the two are in love with each other uh, and uh, it is a very you know ideally kind of a love and in this kind of a setting we have a woman uh, who comes dressed up as a man. Now, in Shakespeare uh, you find lots of plays in Shakespeare where there is a woman character, a female character who dresses up as a man right. And perhaps the most famous example of that is Portia in Merchant of Venice uh, who dresses up as a lawyer, uh, a male lawyer of course, because there's no, there was no female lawyer at that point of time. It would be an in incredible thing if Shakespeare had a female lawyer in a courtroom scene. But you know you, you remember, if you remember Merchant of Venice, uh, you find Portia dresses up as a man, uh, goes and rescues Antonio. Uh, uh, who thinks he's a man? She's a man, and then uh, different complications happen in the play, etc. Now, just to digress a little bit from Two of Night and speak on and talk a little bit on Merchant of Venice, because when you say Portia and how Portia dresses up as a lawyer, remember the courtroom in which the scene happens in Merchant of Venice. It's a very famous scene where Portia tells uh, Shylock the Jew that you know, you know, you can go on and take a pound of flesh 
from Antonio's chest. But mind you, the, the contract says a pound of flesh. It doesn't mention any blood. So you cannot spill any blood uh, if you're cutting the pound of flesh. And you know, you have to abide by the contract. And of course, it's impossible to cut a pound of flesh without dropping a, a blood of blood. So the entire thing becomes annulled and that's how Antonio is saved. You, you know that in Merchant of Venice. But the point is, the courtroom scene in Merchant of Venice is a very good example of a performative space. Because people dress up in a courtroom, people become lawyers, someone becomes a judge in a courtroom. So the rhetoric in a courtroom is very performative, right? It's not a normal rhetoric, it's not how you normally speak uh, when you meet a friend. So the rhetoric, the legal rhetoric in Merchant of Venice is itself quite performative. Now, adding on to the performativity of a courtroom space, we have a woman dressed up as a man, a male lawyer. Right? Suppose she addresses up as a male lawyer, becomes a male lawyer, assumes the identity of a male lawyer and rescues Antonio. Right? So we have an example of double performative video over here. Right? So even if you were a normal male person who dressed up as a lawyer uh, in order to perform something rhetorically, that too would be performative because that is dramatic, that is sometimes excessive, that is designed to produce a certain kind of effect. So if you go back to the definition I just provided, it's, it's, it's a kind of performance which is deliberately designed to produce a certain kind of effect. The effect could be reverence or uh, adulation, love, fear, a combination of all these. Okay? So it is by default performative. Now in the case of Merchant of Venice, it's doubly performative. Now why is it doubly performative? It's doubly performative because we have a woman dressing up as a man and then becoming a lawyer. So it's doubly performative. Right? Now, I could complicate it further. You know, I could watch it from a theatrical perspective, uh, a production perspective and complicate it further by saying that uh, if you look at really in the time of William Shakespeare, uh, the people who are playing the women's roles, they were not female actors in Shakespeare's times. So those would be little boys, those would be young boys, not little boys, young boys or very young men who could pass off as woman by dressing up in a certain kind of way, who had that kind of a voice, etc. Right? So, at another level, at another angle, we have another kind of performativity coming in. So, what I am saying is, these are young male actors, right? these are either boys or male actors who are trying to perform uh, a female's role. Right? So, this is a male actor playing Portia in William Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Now, within the play Merchant of Venice, we have Portia playing Balthazar, right? the, 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 the lawyer, the male lawyer inside the play. So, what we have in the end is a male actor playing a female actor playing a male actor. So, essentially, it is a male actor playing a male actor, a male actor playing a male role. So, can you understand the different levels of performativity that is happening over here? It is quite complex when you think about it. Right? It is like double negation producing a positive. So, it is a male playing a woman playing a man. So, it ends up being a man playing a man. Right? So, it is a very complex play uh, and that is something which is true for any play of Shakespeare. I mean there was no male actor at that point in time. You know, in Renaissance, Elizabeth in England, uh, you know, the idea of female actor, sorry, there was no female actor at that point in time. So, the idea of female actor was, did not exist. So, it had to be a male actor playing a woman's role in, in a particular play. And oftentimes within the play, it will be a woman playing a man. So, it ends up being a male actor playing a male role in a play. So, that happens in Merchant of Venice, that happens in Macbeth, that happens in any play of Shakespeare, wherever we have a very strong female protagonist. Right? Uh, you know, we have the notion of you know, a woman becoming a man and that happens a lot in William Shakespeare's plays. Okay? So, coming back to Two of Night. So, we talked about uh, two like twins, you know, you know, people who look like each other, the, the siblings. Right? So, the woman is called Viola, the man is called Sebastian. They, they are, look exactly like each other, but one is a man, one is a woman, so they are biologically different, but they look exactly alike each other. Right? Now, a shipwreck happens, uh, Sebastian and Viola are separated by the shipwreck and uh, Viola lands up in this island called Illyria, which obviously is a fictional landscape, it does not exist. Uh, but it is somewhere in Europe because everyone is white, they have white names. Uh, so, it is run by a count. So, it is it's presumably some part of the white western civilized civilization where Illyria happens, Illyria is located. Although, we do not quite know where exactly it is, but going by the names it could be somewhere in Italy. 
close to each other because the names are quite Italian if you look at it. So Sebastian and Viola are separated by a shipwreck. Uh, Viola enters Illyria and the first thing she does when she enters Illyria is she dresses up as a man, right? Uh, she dresses up as a man for protection because obviously, um, you know, it's very difficult at that point in time. Uh, I believe it's difficult even today and, and unfortunately uh, in some parts where, you know, if you are a woman with no moorings, with no relatives, nothing, uh, it's often, you know, you often judge, you know, as certain things and it's, it, it gets complicated and it really becomes difficult for you to live a normal life, especially if you come to a particular place on the basis of an accident, right? So what does, uh, you know, Viola do? Viola uh, dresses up as a man. Uh, she gives herself a name, right? She calls herself Cesario, you know, as a male name. And then she takes a job under the count. There's a count called Orsino, as I just mentioned a little while ago. So Viola dresses up as Cesario, takes a job uh, in the count's entourage, uh, and then, you know, runs errands for him. Now the count, Orsino, is madly in love with the, the, the countess. There's a, you know, a duchess, a countess uh, in the play. Uh, called Olivia, right? Who has a different household? Is not related to the count. So the count is in love with her, Olivia, right? So mm, he sends messengers to Olivia, uh, proclaiming his love, right? And Olivia is very cold towards the count. Olivia doesn't quite like the count. You know, she rejects every attempt made by the count uh, to, you know, proclaim his love for her. Now, after Viola slash Cesario takes a job under the count, the count sends her to Olivia, right? Now, mind you, Viola is here dressed as a man. So, the public embodiment of Viola, the social embodiment of Viola is that of a male, right? She has a male name, she has a male dress, she has a male attire. In other words, she is performatively male. And the reason why I am spending some time describing the details of Viola, because I want to emphasize a certain point, a certain idea, that performativity our performative gendered identity is not always dependent on the quote unquote real sexual identity or the real biological identity. Because biologically, Oweya, Viola is a female. But performatively, in terms of the public performative identity, the public performative gendered identity, that is that of a male. Which has got a male name to back it up, Cesario. Right? So, Cesario goes to the Duchess, the Countess, Olivia and carrying messages of love from the Count. Now, interestingly and complicatedly, Shakespeare is a master at complications and any comedy of Shakespeare is a comedy of complications. So, there is a different degree of, uh, you know, uh, complicating things, uh, tying up things uh, and then in the end untying the same things and there is a resolution in the end. So, the very idea of comedy is to complicate certain things and then because it is comedy, the complications will be resolved in the end and you know, hopefully everyone will be happy in the end. Although that is sometimes a bit vague and ambivalent. But anyway, so Caesarea goes to Olivia who falls in love with him, right? Without realizing the fact, without knowing the fact, of course, Olivia has no knowledge of the fact. No one in Illyria has any knowledge of the fact that Cesario actually is a woman, right? Called Viola. So, in other words, what we have is a woman who is actually in love with another woman without knowing it. Well, she thinks she is in love with a man. She thinks she is in love with a man called Cesario. But Cesario does not exist. Cesario is a performative embodied identity, which is unreal. It is strictly public, social, performative embodied identity. There is no such person called Cesario. The real person is a person called Viola who happens to be a woman. So, what we have here is an example of what we call in literature as dramatic irony. The words dramatic irony? Dramatic irony is a situation or a phenomenon uh, through which uh, the audience knows, the audience has certain knowledge, certain characters on the stage has the same knowledge, but certain other characters do not have that knowledge. So, they are being fooled a little bit, they are being, they are ignorant and say certain things which fool them further, right. So, the audience knows it, I mean those of us who read the play, those of us who watch the play, if you are watching a production of Two of Nine, would know immediately that Cesario is actually a woman, there is no such person called Cesario, Cesario is a make, made up person, there is a completely performative person. 
something which is artificially performed, produced. So that is an identity which is produced, is generated, you know, performatively. It doesn't really exist biologically. So Olivia, the countess, falls in love with Cesario, who happens to be uh, actually a woman. Okay, and the play gets more and more complicated because Cesario cannot return Olivia's love, right? Because a, uh, she is a woman, right, and she is a heterosexual woman, so she doesn't return Olivia's love. But more complicatedly, she finds herself falling in love with the count Orsino, under whom she works as a male. So you can understand the level of complications which are happening in Twelfth Night, right? So you have so many. We have this really complex economy of love, which is being created. This is this eros economy, the economy of love. So people are falling in love with one another, right? Often not knowing who one really is, right? We have a series of deceptions. We have a series of complications. We have a series of performative gender identities, which have nothing to do with real biological identities. So Cesario, the man, is actually Viola, the woman, who is performing the role of an errant boy, an errant man, working for the count, Orsino. So she is in love with Orsino, and Orsino likes him, right? You know, him slash her. It's quite complicated, right? So Orsino thinks this is a very nice, um, you know, nice errant boy, a nice male. Uh, working for me very faithfully. Uh, so he grows, he develops this fondness, this, this avuncular fondness uh, for Cesario without realizing that he is actually a woman. Right? And Viola on herself is in love with Orsino, but she can't confess it because that will reveal her true identity. Right? And she wants to retain the identity. So she's sort of trapped in her own performative self. She's imprisoned in her own performative self. Okay? And Olivia the Countess is meanwhile in love with Cesario, who happens to be uh, actually a woman. So it's a very complex economy of love which has been created on Twelfth Night. And you know, we sort of tend to think, okay, this is how is this going to end? Uh, how is this going to be resolved? So are these three people, will these three people will co be constantly fooled by each other? Will they live in this uh, idea of this drama of deception? Will they live in this drama of you know, really performative gendered identities which are complex, which are you know, different from biological identities? How is the resolution going to happen? There is a key question which props up on Twelfth Night, midway in the play. And what does Shakespeare do? The only thing he can do, he brings in the shipwrecked twin. Sebastian, who looks exactly like Viola, right? I mean, he's, he's a like twin. They, they look like each other completely. They're, they're siblings, right? Sebastian and Viola are siblings. So Sebastian comes to Illyria uh, randomly, um, mourning the death. I mean, he thinks it's the death, the death of a sister, etc., etc. And he sort of wanders across Illyria, not knowing anyone. Okay. Now suddenly, uh, Olivia, the Countess, sees him. Right. And what does Olivia think? Who do you think Olivia takes Sebastian to be? Cesario, right? the male performative self of Viola. Now, isn't that what Sebastian is? Sebastian is a male version of Viola. He looks exactly like Viola except that he is really a man. Right? So Sebastian actually fits into Cesario perfectly, biologically. He is really a man, quote unquote really a man. So Olivia goes up to Sebastian and you know again pr proposes her love for him. Now, she's done that with Cesario before, but of course Cesario, being Viola, had rejected it. Uh, Olivia had continued or persisted in her love for uh, Cesario, and now she finds Sebastian, who she thinks is Cesario, and again rearticulates uh, her love for him. But Sebastian uh, has no reason to reject Olivia, right? Sebastian is a heterosexual male. Uh, Sebastian mm, sees himself being ewed by this wonderful rich countess. So he accepts um, her love. He accepts her proclamation of love. Right? And you know, Olivia is overjoyed. At this point, the Count Orsino comes in. Right? And at this point, the Count Orsino uh, comes in with you know, Viola, who is actually you know, who's dressed up as Cesario. And now we have the two twins standing alongside each other. 
while up dressed up as Cesario, Sebastian dressed up as Sebastian. So essentially, what, what people in the stage are watching, what people like Orsino and Olivia are watching, are two men who look exactly like each other. But we know better. We, the audience, we know better. We, the reader, know, know, we, we know better because we read the play. We know exactly what's happening behind the scenes. So again, this is a continuation of the dramatic irony which we talked about. So immediately the resolution happens uh, and then the entire economy of love is reconfigured very conveniently. Uh, it's sort of disturbing how conveniently and how quickly the reconfiguration happens. So what, what, do, what, does, what happens at this point? The, the obvious thing happens at this point. So uh, Olivia, who was in love with uh, Cesario, suddenly realizes that Cesario was actually a woman uh, called Viola. Uh, so obviously she being a heterosexual woman cannot continue in that relationship. But luckily enough for her, uh, she's got a male counterpart of uh, you know, the, the unreal Cesario. She's got a real man uh, who looks like exactly like Cesario. So Olivia quickly transfers her love for Cesario slash Viola onto Sebastian. And it's almost absurd, and this is the reason why Shakespeare's comedies are so complex. It's almost absurd how quickly the human emotion is sort of transferred to another self, to another image. Right? So uh, Sebastian and Olivia, they are happily connected and a heterosexual relationship and a heterosexual romantic relationship. Right? Now Ursino the Duke. Uh, who had this fondness for Cesario, suddenly realizes that Cesario actually happens to be a woman called Viola. So very quickly, the fondness, the male-male fondness, quickly converts into a male-female romantic love. So suddenly he, he realizes, okay, if this is actually a woman, I am probably in love with her. Right? And again, it's sort of absurd and almost problematic in a way in which how quickly human emotions, uh, deep, profound human emotions like love, adoration, uh, hatred, loathing, adulation, they quickly change in Shakespeare, right? And that's the reason why I consider Two of Night to be a bit of a problem play, especially in relation to gender studies, right? So what happens in the end of Two of Night is quite, you know, it's a nice resolution, but it's quite complex as well. So Orsino the Duke uh, realizes that you know, his uh, male fondness for Cesario can quickly be converted into a romantic relationship because Cesario happens to be actually a woman you know, called Viola. So Orsino and Viola they marry, Olivia and Sebastian they marry and very quickly everything becomes heterosexual, everything becomes quote unquote normative uh, and the normative gender relationships are re-established in 2 of 9. But for a long part in the play, for a long time in the play, people were actually engaging in same-sex relationship without knowing it. So Olivia had been in love with a woman all this time without knowing it. A woman she thought is actually a man. So what Two of Night does very adeptly I think and very complexly is it plays up the difference between the biological identity and the performative identity, especially in relation to gender. So the biological identity of Viola is that of a woman. But the performative identity that she produces culturally, socially, ideologically, discursively is that of a man. And how does she do it? She does it through dress, she does it through language, she does it through embodiment. And this brings us back to the beginning of this lecture when I talked about embodiment as the process through which you generate your gender identity. It's a real process, it's a motto, normal, real, embodied, you know, psychological, neural process as well as equally a discursive, ideological, cultural and social process. It's a combination of both. So the biological viola generates a discursive male identity. The biological viola generates an artificial male identity which is strictly social. It doesn't exist biologically. Cesario doesn't exist. There's no such person called Cesario. Cesario is a performative identity which is produced by Viola. And that, that, that really complicates everything, right? So that brings us back, as I mentioned, to the relationship between embodiment and performativity, especially in relation to gendered identity. So what this lecture has hopefully done 
is to look at gender as something which can sometimes potentially transcend or transgress biological identity. So, gendered identity can sometimes be different from biological identity. So, biologically you could be a man or a woman, but you know your gendered self, your gendered identity could be different and the, the, the way in which this difference is produced is through performativity, is through different orders of embodiment. Now, this performativity, this embodiment can be as I mentioned to dress, to language, to embodiment, to your body, to food, to a different, to a series of different kinds of vectors, to a series of different kinds of signifiers, right. And so, in Shakespeare we find there is different kinds of embodiment happening all the time and you can think of many other plays of Shakespeare as you like it, uh, you know you can think of you know lots of plays in which people dress up differently. And this idea of dressing up in Shakespeare is quite interesting and again uh, you know I, I just revealed uh, I just sort of gave away a certain linguistic uh, slippage over here. So, whenever you know you, you talk about uh, a woman uh, dressing up as a man, if you look at the language is dressing up. So, the woman dressing up as a man uh, is supposedly having some kind of an elevation, you know you are becoming somewhat uh, more powerful, you are becoming somewhat uh, someone with more agency you know because you are becoming a male because you are performing yourself as a male identity and that gives you some kind of agency. Because if you come back to Twelfth Night, uh, the reason why Viola dresses up as Cesario in the play is because she believes that will give her more agency, more financial agency, social agency, uh, cultural agency etcetera. And that is the reason why she dresses up as a man despite being a woman in the play. And only in the end when the you know the real man appears, the real Cesario who is actually Sebastian appears, only then can she actually reveal her identity, her female identity. So, only then uh, is the normal is the real biological identity brought back to the fore, which have been disguised for so long, which have been concealed for so long, you know strategically concealed for so long, right. So, all these come, come together in Shakespeare's True of Night. Uh, and in many other plays of Shakespeare, where we talk about gender as being some kind of a performance. But mind you, and this is crucial, it is not a normal performance, it is a performance which is deliberately dramatic, it is deliberately excessive, it is deliberately designed to produce a certain kind of effect, right. So, you, you, you become something. And it does not always depend, it does not always matter that when you are becoming a, you know, a man from a woman, even if you are a man and you are becoming something else, you know that too is a gendered performativity. So, you are a quote unquote passive man and then suddenly you are becoming this hegemonic dominant male to a certain kind of performance. That too is a very good example of what we call in masculinity studies as performativity to which uh, a certain kind of marginalized masculinity becomes the hegemonic masculinity through a certain performance which produces uh, a series of effect. Uh, you know, it could be all oh, wonder, etcetera, etcetera. And you can think of many films. You can think of many, many popular films which do that, right? So you can think of a popular Hollywood film like Mask, right? If you, if you, some of you may have watched a film, and if you if you see the film Mask, and there, there's a component in this course in the end when we talk about popular culture, how how does gender relate to, uh, how how is gender represented or manifested in popular culture? And you know, we'll talk about Mask there. But just to give you a little summary of that. Uh, and how it connects to the content of this lecture today. In Mask, we find a very passive marginalized man suddenly becoming a powerful hegemonic, you know, sort of a superhero like presence through a certain mask, which is obviously a symbol to which the transformation happens, to which the embodiment uh, is sort of changed. So, in Mask, we find, uh, you know, uh, the film features uh, a very passive, uh, you know, non productive is not really a successful a super successful person, he is a very normal average run of the mill person and also ran uh, who suddenly becomes uh, through a mask uh, symbolically who suddenly becomes this performatively dominant persona. So, it does not depend it does not always uh, travel from one sexual identity, one biological identity to another biological identity, it can travel within one biological identity that is what I am trying to say uh, in this particular part. So, it can be from uh, being a certain kind of woman to another kind of woman, it can be through a certain kind of man to another kind of man right. 
from marginalized to dominant, from dominant to marginalized. So you know, the, these transformations can happen again through performativity, through our embodiment, through different kinds of embodiment. So later in this course, we will do a, a, a drama called Look Back in Anger, where we will we'll, we'll notice this relationship, this very complex relationship between performativity and embodiment in the context of display very, very crucially. And again, it is a theatre, it is something which happens on stage, so it gives you a, so a double performativity by default. Right? So, you know, the moment it is a stage thing, the moment it is a performance on stage, it becomes performative because, you know, it is people performing different roles and within the play, there are other roles which have been performed as well. So, just to wind up, just to conclude the lecture today, uh, performativity and embodiment, these are very crucial concepts, especially in relation to gendered identities and you know, the way gendered identities are produced, reproduced, constructed, deconstructed and reconstructed, right. Performativity and embodiment, these are biological motor phenomenon. So, these, these happen to the body, these happen to the nerves, these happen to the brain, these happen to the mind, etc. But equally, these are cultural, ideological, discursive phenomena. Because what you perform, what you produce out of the performative quality is an identity, an identity which is social, an identity which is cultural, an identity which is discursive, an identity which may not be related to a real biological identity. So, take the example of you know Viola in 2 of 9, this reason why I talked about this play in some details. right? So, Viola the biological identity is the core self of the person, but that core self is subsumed temporarily, is replaced temporarily uh, and what we have instead is the production of a new self which is male. So, the performative gendered identity which is Caesarea is produced out of this core self, the core self is replaced, we do not get to see the core self, right. And now, that identity is strictly social, that identity is strictly public, it has got nothing to do with the biological identity of the real Viola, right. And hence, I talked about if you go back to the earlier part of this uh, lecture when I sort of put up the definition of embodiment and performativity, it often inhabits the interface between the real and the unreal, between the biological and the discursive is both, right. We, we cannot sort of say it is just real or just unreal. So, we cannot say Caesario is completely unreal because Caesario is a performative identity which is produced by a real person. So, in that sense it is real, it is an extension of the real, right. So, both these concepts performativity and embodiment this is a very crucial concept especially in relation to gender studies. And again, when I look at the relationship between gender and race which we will in some part of the play, in some part of this particular course, we will see even in that relationship, gender and race, performativity and embodiment become very crucial categories. So, we will do a play, we will do a little essay called uh, Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell. There we look at how race comes into being, how race plays a very crucial category, especially in relation to which performativity is enacted and how that enactment of performativity produces certain kinds of identity which are racially mediated. So, race becomes a very important factor in performativity and embodiment, especially uh, in a situation of racial inequality. So, in, in Shooting Elephant, when we look at the essay by Orwell uh, that is set in colonial Burma, right. Uh, so, it is colonial times, the difference between a white man and a non-white man is massive, uh, it is a discursive difference between you know being a white person and a non-white person. So, in that discursive difference, how do things like performativity and embodiment come into play, especially in relation to gendered identities, especially in relation to way in which gender is produced out of the biological identity. And also, the third term which we talked about in the previous lecture uh, will come into play again agency, the, the ability of the self to enact, express, articulate their free will, right. To what extent is agency inhibited by performativity? To what extent is agency exhibited by performativity? Or is it a combination of inhibition and exhibition? Is it a combination of imprisonment and you know display? Right? So, performativity is very crucially connected to agency, especially in relation to gender studies. Right. So, all these theoretical terms hopefully you know you, you, you have some idea of how these theoretical terms play out 
So, these are not just abstract concepts, these are not just conceptual categories we are talking about. These are categories, these are concepts which are crucial in relation to which how these happen in real situations. Because, you know, in Twelfth Night is about a real situation, it is about it is a drama about real human beings trying to uh, navigate their way across the immediate environment and you know I use the word navigate quite consciously because it relates to embodiment. You know, it is embodiment as if you remember the definition at the beginning of this particular lecture, embodiment is a way in which a self navigates across this immediate environment. Right? So, this navigation of the self which is a combination of the neural motor mechanism as well as the cultural social mechanism that constitutes embodiment right that constitutes you know the, the manner the mechanism which produces gendered identities right. So, I will conclude here today, but just to wind up performativity embodiment and agency these are very crucial categories in relation to identities especially in relation to gender studies. Right. So, we look at gender studies in literature, how it is displayed in literature, how it is represented in literature and also in social situations we find that you know gender is something as and I mentioned this in the beginning the first lecture as well, gender is a process of becoming as well as a process of unbecoming. Gender is not a static concept, gender is a dynamic process right a dynamic process which is sometimes uh, you know informed by the biological identity, but it can also potentially override the biological identity. It can transgress the biological identity, it can produce a different identity uh, an identity which is you know designed by difference right. So, gender is a term which can be used which can be seen uh, and I mentioned Judith Butler at the beginning and the previous lecture gender as a part of speech is a verb. It is a process of becoming, it is a process of unbecoming, it is a process of being someone, it is a process of not being someone. So, gender can be a consolidation of certain categories, gender can be a subversion of certain categories, gender can be a break from certain categories, gender can be a resurrection of certain categories. So, if you come to 12th night the, the literary example in the case study the experiment uh, if you will which we use uh, to, to sort of look at gender and performance and performativity and identity and embodiment in this particular lecture. In the case of 2F9 you know the, the entire idea of gender is a play and I use the word play quite consciously. It is a play in the sense that it is a drama, it is a drama of gender, it is a drama of becoming and unbecoming, but it is also a play between identities right. It is a movement between identities between the biological identity and a gendered identity between the, the real uh, core neural motor identity and the social public you know cultural identity the discursive identity is a play is, is so gender has a degree of mobility to it especially in 2F9 and 2F9 is an example I use to, to sort of talk about this mobility. It is the mobility which is ideologically defined which is discursively defined, but it is the mobility which is enacted through a motor neural process is you are doing it as a person, as a body, as a motor mechanism, as a neural self right. You are doing it to your brain, you are doing it to your limbs, you are doing it to your body, but at the same time you are doing it as an extension into a social self, into a social space. So, again this, this, this interface between the social space and the biological space this is crucial in gender studies. So, 2 of 9 really is a very fine example according to me of the play of gender. It is a play, it is a drama, but it is a play within a play as well. It is a play which plays with gender, it is a drama which dramatizes the difference between the biological identity and the gendered identity especially uh, in a very very interesting complex social situation as we find in 2 of night. So, hopefully you, you have an idea of what performativity is, you have an idea of what embodiment is and you can think you can draw on these examples, you can draw on these theoretical concepts and definitions and you can look at numerous examples in literature right and you are very welcome you know and this is just going to be a very interactive session and there, there is a scope for interaction uh, at some point in this course. You are very very welcome to offer examples of your own. So, I, I use a canonical example of a very familiar play which might be familiar to most of you because you know Shakespeare is a canonical writer, but there are numerous examples you can think of where the play between the biological identity and the gendered identity is often very complex it's, it sort of opens up it is deconstructed right it becomes the process of becoming unbecoming and re-becoming right it is a process of construction deconstruction and reconstruction. And this brings us finally this brings us to the idea to the notion that we started off in the first lecture that gender is a text. Gender is constituted by textuality 
is not a given, it's not something which is static and absolute and permanent, it is a text and any text. So, the, the, the way we define a text is that substance which can be constructed through a material, intellectual, abstract, ideological, economic process and anything which can be constructed can be deconstructed and reconstructed and that is the basis of the textuality of gender. It is something, it is a process which can be constructed, which can be deconstructed and which can be reconstructed and two of tonight by William Shakespeare as well as Merchant of Venice which we mentioned briefly in the course of this lecture are very fine examples of literary texts which deal, which play up this textuality, texts which play up the textuality of gender, right? plays which play up the play between biological identity and gendered identity especially through performativity. You perform something, you perform a social self, you perform an ideological self, you perform a discursive self right? and through these performances you problematize any idea of permanent biological identity. Right? So, you can see how this idea of gender is quite postmodern. This idea of post this performativity is very postmodern because it breaks away from any grand narrative of permanent gendered identities. There is no such thing as a permanent gendered identity. So, it is something which you are constantly producing all the time, and anything which can be produced can be reproduced and unproduced. And two of is a very extreme example is, is a woman becoming a man, etcetera, etcetera, as I just mentioned. But also, you know, you can think of less extreme examples of a man becoming something else another man, a different kind of man, a woman becoming a different kind of woman through a performative quality. Right? So, through a rhetorical quality, through a performative quality, through an embodied quality, through a sartorial quality, a different kinds of quality, different kinds of apparatus can come together and produce different kinds of gendered identities often within the same biological identity. So, you are still a woman, but a different kind of woman, you are still a man, but a different kind of man. Okay. We will talk about this in more details in a subsequent lecture, but hopefully you will have you, you have some idea of what these concepts are and you are very welcome and you are very encouraged as, as a matter of fact to think of other literary examples that you can think of which do similar things, bring about this entire complex of performativity, embodiment and identity and play up, open up any easy assumption about gender and biological identity. Thank you for watching and we will have another lecture very, very soon. See you there. Thank you.